Welcome again. Today, I'll recap what we've done in data compression, and then we'll get back to the central topic, if you like, of the information theory course, which is noisy channel coding, which we looked at in lecture one. Let me start with a little question I set for you last time. The question is about this ensemble, A, B, C, D, with probabilities of half a quarter, eighth, and eighth and with the symbol code shown there. And the question is, if we are encoding from this source and then we reach into the encoded stream and pluck out one bit, what's the probability that it's a one? Please talk to your neighbor about your answer to this question. Okay. Let's have a quick vote. Um, there are three options there. You've worked out P1. I hope you've talked to your neighbor about it. And I'm going to ask you, is your P1 less than half, half, or bigger than half? And you can also vote for Z, which is I don't know. Votes for Z, I don't know. OK. Votes for A, P1 is less than a half. OK. Got a few votes there. Four votes for A. Votes for B, P1 is equal to a half. One, one vote for B. Votes for C, P1 is bigger than a half. Everyone else except the people who, okay, we've got one there. Um, and no one voted for Z, so everyone else must be asleep already. Okay, um, well, we've got a range of, of answers there. Um, people from community A uh, who've got P1 less than a half. Could a volunteer take us through the uh, argument? What, what is your P1 um, and what was your method for calculating P1? Since you're in the majority. Okay, who voted for A? <laughs> All right, what was, what was your P1? What was the value? Anyone? Unknown. <laughs> OK. Um, well, can I help out? Let's talk about the fraction of the code word that is made of ones and see what happens if we look at that. So, Code word A, the code word for A, which happens half the time, has got zero ones in it. Uh, code word B is half ones, code word C is two thirds ones, and D is 100% ones. So I've, I've defined a thing called FI, it's the fraction of the code word which is ones. So, a lot of people are voting for A, but you're being very shy about saying why. And I'm going to now give a possible argument that might give an answer that's in the A camp. So we pick a code word first with these probabilities. Then we pick a random bit to see if it's uh, a 1 or a 0. And these are the probabilities of it being a 1 or a 0. So here's a calculation. Probability of getting a 1. I'll put a question mark on it, because I want to check if I've got your reasoning right. Probability of getting a 1 is a sum over all letters in the alphabet. Probability of picking that letter times the probability of it turning out to be a 1 when you pick a random bit from the code word. Yeah? Is that the sort of reasoning that the A community went for? You're allowed to nod if talking is difficult. OK, we're getting some nods. All right, so we add that up. And we've got a half times 0 plus a quarter times a half plus an eighth times two thirds plus an eighth times one. All right, which gives us one eighth plus an eighth plus an eighth times two thirds, which is one eighth times two and two thirds. Two and two thirds is eight over three, which has given us one third. Okay, 
Does anyone who voted for A think that this is roughly why they voted for A? Hands up if that's so. Okay, we, we're, get, we're getting somewhere. So, there's a candidate answer there of a third, but not everyone agreed. We've got some Bs and Cs. Does anyone want to challenge this and say, no, it's wrong. Here's an argument why that's wrong. Anyone? Or has everyone gone over to the A side? <laughs> Yeah, Martin. Some quarters are longer, right? So you're more likely to take the Okay. So Martin just said, if you reach into the stream, and some of the code words are long and some are short, and you reach in and pick a random bit, you're more likely to hit one of the long code words. All right? So this isn't the correct way to pick a random bit from the stream. We need to take into account the lengths. So that's a good argument. Okay, so this is probably wrong. At least it's the wrong method. It may not be the wrong answer. So, length matter. Length of code words matter. Any other argument for an alternative answer? Okay, let me give you one other argument for this, and then we'll do the calculation again. What's the information content of this probability here? Answer, one bit, two bits, three bits, and three bits. What's the ideal encoded lengths for probabilities? The ideal encoded lengths are the Shannon information contents, which are, I'll, from now on, I will just call them the information contents. What are the lengths of these code words? Length i is one, two, three, and three. So the lengths match the information contents. So this is a case where we have a symbol code with perfectly matched code lengths to the probabilities. That means you can't compress any better than this because we have our source coding theorem that says you can compress down to the entropy and if the, expect if the lengths of your code words match the information contents, it's unbeatably good. And this is a valid code, it's a prefix code, so this, this will work. Now, if we use this code to encode stuff from the source, and if it were the case that the bits coming out after encoding were not 50, 50 zeros and ones, completely random, independent, unrelated to each other, if, if they were not 50, 50, then we could compress it some more. Because Shannon says, if the probabilities aren't 50, 50, we can make codes, you know, with dustbin bags full of lottery tickets and all that sort of stuff. We could do further compression. But you can't compress anymore because we've already got it down to the entropy. Therefore, without doing any calculation at all, it must be the case that P1 is a half. So B is the right answer because it's perfectly compressed. And if it's perfectly compressed, it'll look random. Okay, so the right answer is B. So what went wrong with this calculation? Well, let's just redo it and do the calculation in a way that takes into account lengths. Let's think about it this way. We've got a great big bucket. We're going to put bits into the bucket. Each time you pick a code word, some more bits go in the bucket, and some of those are ones. And we're interested in the ratio. In this bucket, what fraction of them are ones? So, let's give ourselves an extra column in here, which is not the fraction that are ones, but the actual number that are ones. So the number of ones in this code word is zero, in this one it's one, in this one it's two, and in this one it's three. So on average, when I pick another code word, how many new bits go into the code word? We'll put that downstairs. And the answer is sum over i, p i, l i. And on average, how many ones go into the bucket? Well, that's sum over i, p i, n i. OK. How does that differ from what we did over here? Well, f i is the ratio of n i over l i. So you can see. We're using a different thing upstairs, and to compensate for that, we're using something different downstairs. Okay, so this is the average number of ones that go in the bucket whenever you pick 
a new code word, this is the average number of bits that go in. The ratio of those is going to be the fraction of bits that I want. And if we do that, we have the upstairs thing is a half times zero plus a quarter times one plus an eighth times two plus an eighth times three. And downstairs, it's our old friend, the expected length, which is the entropy of this probability distribution, which is, is it not seven over four? I'm doing this from memory. And what's upstairs? That's a quarter. And that's three eighths. And that's a quarter. So in eighths, we've got two plus two plus three, which is seven over eight over seven over four, which is half. So that's the long way to get to the answer. But the sneaky information theory based answer is just to say it's perfectly compressed. Case closed. It's 50 50. And it's not only 50 50, it's got no correlations in it at all. There can be no correlations in the encoded stream, because otherwise we could use the information theory argument and say, oh, those correlations could be exploited, those dependencies. Any questions? So we love information theory. It provides you with very powerful, very brief arguments for things that mean that you don't need to do calculations anymore. Last time, let me just recap what we did. We introduced symbol codes, uh, or rather, the time before last, we introduced symbol codes. And um, symbol codes are widely used. We have a Huffman algorithm that gives you optimal symbol codes, and their expected lengths are within one bit per character of the entropy. But we argued in the previous lecture a week ago that doesn't actually wrap up compression. We don't like symbol codes because being within one bit per character is not very good if the actual entropy per character is something small like 0.1 bits. And we argued that often that will be the case if, say, we're compressing English. We played a game that gave us the idea that you could use identical twins at the sender and the receiver in order to make a compressor. And then we looked at arithmetic coding. And arithmetic coding is this way of thinking about a binary file as defining a single n real number between 0 and 1 to an extremely large precision. And any source file can be represented in the same way as an, corresponding to an interval on the real line between 0 and 1. And I argued that when you do arithmetic coding, you will get compression down to within two bits of the information content of the entire file. So this is, in terms of its overhead, this plus two is potentially about a factor of n smaller than the overhead you get if you use symbol codes. So arithmetic coding is, in almost all cases, far, far better than symbol codes. And I just wanted to flesh out how you'd use arithmetic coding in practice. I, I talked about the idea of an oracle, that being a piece of software which uses some procedure to predict the next character given all the characters x1 through xt minus 1 that have been seen. And I wanted to just give you an example of how this works in real state-of-the-art compressors. So here is a fragment of uh, Jane Austen's Emma. Um, this is the last um, 50 or so characters. And the context is alarmed at the PRO. And the question is, what comes next? So how do real compression algorithms work? Well, a fairly near state-of-the-art compressor that's very widely used is a compressor called PPM. And here's how PPM works. It's called prediction by partial match. And it's slightly ad hoc, but there's a bunch of theoretical justifications and improvements we, we can make to it. But let me just describe the ad hoc method. Here's the idea. We look at the context of the last five characters of the document to define the context for the next character. Then we look at the entire file of everything that we've seen so far, and we say, have we seen that context before in the entire file? So this is how we're going to then predict what happens next. We go and find 
all of those occurrences, and here they are shown in blue. So E space PRO has happened one, two, three, four, five times already in Jane Austen's Emma, and this shows what happened next. There was a V, a V, an O, a P, and an S. So a first stab would be to say, let's use these six gram statistics, the raw six gram statistics, to say, all right, there's a two, six, uh, two, one, two, how many were there? One, two, three, four, five. It's happened five times. So there's a two-fifths-ish chance of getting a V next. There's a one-fifth chance of an O, a one-fifth chance of a P, and a one-fifth chance of an S. But it's, also, I haven't seen that much data, so we'd better allow some probability for other things happening. How do we allow for other things happening? Well, the PPM approach is to say, let's back off to shorter length contexts as well and say, what happened in context? Space PRO, PRO, RO, O, and in any context at all. And fold in those other one, two, three, four, five possibilities in addition to the six gram statistics and weight them together in a, a smartish way. And that's how PPM works. And it gives you extremely good uh, compression, um, state of the art um, on most files. It doesn't do as well as humans do. Human audiences like yourselves can predict English a lot better. And clearly, it doesn't understand grammar and dictionaries and, and so forth. But it does a lot of learning of raw statistics. And that's, that gets you a, a long way towards good compression. So that's PPM. OK, so the question was, does it learn the six gram statistics of the document, of the entire document, and then compress it, or does it do it on the fly? And the important answer is, it's just like you guys, it, the identical twin audiences, it does things on the fly. So when we're asked to predict in this context, we then say, how often has E space PRO happened already before now? We don't look ahead into the future. So the predictions are based only on what we have already seen. OK, any other questions? There's a couple more things I want to mention about arithmetic coding. One is, uh, as I showed you last time, we can make other uses of arithmetic coding. We can make an extremely efficient writing system. And the one I showed you was called Dasher. Um, that's based on the idea that uh, writing involves making gestures of some sort, maybe wiggling fingers or scribbling with a stick. Um, and we want to turn those gestures into text as efficiently as possible. And compression is all about taking text and turning it into a bit string, which in arithmetic coding is views, viewed as a real number. And so we can make a very good writing system by saying, OK, let's have the gesture just define a real number by steering our spaceship in a two-dimensional world. And that will make us, if we turn it on its head, a very efficient writing system. So you make your gesture, and out comes text. So that's the Dasher concept. And I showed you that, and it's free software, and um, help is always welcome to make Dasha better. And there's another application for arithmetic coding I wanted to mention. And this is the idea of efficiently generating random samples. Let me give you an example. Let's say I asked you to simulate a bent coin, and I said, OK, let's fix PA to, I don't know, 0 0.01, and PB is the rest. Please simulate 10 million tosses of this bent coin, and I will provide you with random bits, a random number generator. The question is, how many bits will you need to use to generate um, 10 million tosses of this coin? Let's say N from now on instead of 10 million. A standard way of solving this problem is to say, oh, well, I'll use the random bits you can provide me with uh, to make um, real numbers between 0 and 1. So I'll generate things that I'll think of as real numbers uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. That will guzzle up 32 bits per real number if it's a standard random number generator. So we read in 32 bits, interpret them as defining a number between 0 and 1. Then we look to see if u is less than pa. And if it is, then we spit out an a, and otherwise we spit out a b. This method will cost you 32 bits per character. All right? 
Can we do better and do we care? And the answer is yes and maybe. So yes, we can do much better because we could take an arithmetic coder and think about it this way. Let's um, wipe the board. Imagine sticking a pin into the world of an arithmetic coder. What happens if you stick a pin uniformly at random into this line that goes from 0 to, to 1? Or into, uh, into one of those lines? What comes out? What's the probability of what comes out if you stick in a pin and use it to select a string of text? Have a chat to your neighbor. OK, what I've drawn on the board here is a couple of different arithmetic coding worlds that run from 0 to 1. This is one for some source with an alphabet uh, with characters A, B, C, D with different probabilities. And what we noticed last time was the arithmetic coding method gives you intervals between 0 and 1 whose size is the probability of the string equaling that particular string. Probability that x is a followed by c is the size of this little interval here. Here I've drawn the one for the bent coin. This is 99% and this is 1%. And then we recurse and subdivide this in the same way and we get this is the little bit for a, b in here, and then here's the bit for a, a, b, and, and so forth. All right, if we come along and stick in a pin, the probability that the pin will land inside this interval here is this probability. So the probability that if you then read out the string we've got, the probability it will begin a, c is the probability that a string begins with a, c. So sticking in a pin at random is a way of picking a string from the probability distribution of your language model. Okay, so what we can do with bent coins is make the arithmetic decoder, encoder and decoder, for the bent coin, then bring along random bits, random noughts and ones, so as to, to define where a pin goes in. The, the pin, you stick in a pin between 0 and 1, you, you do that by having an infinite source of zeros and ones to define where we are on the line. And so you start guzzling up those zeros and ones, find out where the pin is to the first bit, two bits, three bits, blah, 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 and start reading out bits with your decoder, reading out A's and B's with your decoder. How many bits is that going to need? Well, on average, it's just like compression. Whatever the binary entropy of 0.01 is, 0.1 or something like that, uh, that's on average how many bits you will need. So in contrast to needing 32 bits per coin toss, you'll need this many bits. So the arithmetic coding method for generating random samples for the bent coin is going to need binary entropy of 0.01 bits per coin toss, which is smaller than one, quite a lot smaller than one. So the, it's going to be more than a factor of 32 times more efficient with your random bits. And if random bits are a valuable thing, you may well want to do this. It, it may strike you as elegant, and it may actually save you money. And I want to close this discussion by just giving you a little bit of evidence that we do actually care about saving random bits, because random bits are not free. If you want random bits, you have to get them from somewhere, and if what you're doing has any um, sort of principal purpose, you need to verify that they're good random bits. And so here's a CD that I received in the post a few years ago, and the CD came with a message saying that this CD contains random bits, and they've been generated thanks to the financial support of a couple of uh, US government grants. And they're distributed uh, under that grant from Florida State University to academics all around the world who want random bits. So random bits are valuable, and this is proof that 
uh, serious researchers and funders viewed Random Bits as being important enough to actually spend US government money on. So that's a, a, an argument for not wanting to waste Random Bits. Any questions? Okay, we have now... Oh. Uh, can you answer another way of viewing why the, um, the first method is suggested isn't optimal? Is because it's you could actually make numbers that are not Yes, so the question um, is, are there other ways of thinking why this is a bad idea to do with the precision of the numbers you need? So to make this decision about is it an A or a B, um, often you only need the first bit to already tell you, okay, <laughs> we, we don't need to look at the next 31 bits, the first bit has already made the decision. So we're wasting bits there. And conversely, actually if you look in detail at, at the probability that this will spit out uh, a one. It's not going to be exactly 1%, is it? It'll be some ratio of um, sort of n, uh, uh, let's call it m over 2 to 32, where m is some integer. And so it's not actually going to perfectly nail <laughs> the exact ratio. It'll be within one, one part in 2 to 32, which is pretty good, but um, it, it won't give you the right, exactly the right answer. So, yes, it, it's, it's wasteful because it's using loads of bits to make a decision about a single bit. Um, and arithmetic coding is better. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to now move on to the topic of noisy channels. And noisy channels have inputs and outputs, and one of the things we want to do with noisy channels is infer what the input might have been given the output of the channel. So, a theme of noisy channels is going to be we need to understand inference. And once we're clear on how to do inference, we'll also be talking about how to measure information content in the context of noisy channels. So we know how to measure information content for a single random variable like tossing a bent coin or drawing a random letter from English. It's all about log 1 over p, and that's it. But for noisy channels, it's all a little bit more interesting because we've got inputs, we've got outputs. We're interested in questions like how much information does seeing this output convey about the input? So we want to learn how to do that. And to start off with, I just want to give you a little um, puzzle to think about. And th this it doesn't involve a noisy channel. It just involves three cards. And here are the three cards, and I'll introduce you to them one at a time. Here's a card which is white and white on the front and the reverse, okay? Here's a card that's brown on the front and the reverse. Right? And here's a card that's brown on one side and white on the other. So we've got three cards and now what I'm going to do is I'll shuffle them and turn them over randomly and hide them and draw one card at random and plonk it down in front of you so you can see it. And then I'm going to ask you about the other side of the card. All right? So I shuffle and randomize. I'm not doing any magic tricks or anything here. It's just everything you see is what's happening. So we shuffle them up, and then I randomly grab a card and plonk it down like that. All right? And I show you the front on one side of the card, and it's white. And the question is, what's on the other side? The question is, given that you're now seeing a white face, what's the probability that the other face of this card is white? Please turn to your neighbor and have a chat about that question. <coughs> Okay, votes for Z, which means I don't know. Okay, we've got a few don't knows. Votes for the probability is less than a half. Anyone? No votes. It's bigger than a half. A few. Seven-ish. And votes for C, it's half, it's 50-50. One, two, three, four, five, six, grand, okay. So we have some clear uncertainty about this. Grand. I like it when that happens. So um, 
let's have an argument from the uh, second community. Why is it 50-50? Anyone? Yeah. Good, so uh, the answer I just heard was, by logic, it's either this card or that card that's sitting down there on the desk, and we don't have any additional information, so it must be 50-50. Okay, and we've got a load of people who disagree with you, so would one of them like to give an argument why that compelling argument of logic was wrong? Yes? Okay, so what I just heard was there's three possible ways of getting a white thing facing up. You're either looking at that side or that side or that side, and all three of those possibilities are equally likely. So either this hypothesis or that one or that one, and when we turn it, out, turn it over, we'll find out um, whether the other side is this or the other side is this or is that. So that means it's two-thirds, yeah? Two-thirds chance is what that argument steered towards. Good. Uh, does anyone want to add anything? Change your mind? Give another argument? Vote for A? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a nice argument. So the argument said, think about the other side of the card, which is either going to end up being white or brown. And right at the beginning, before I brought out the card, I could have asked you, please place a bet. Is the, the face that you can't see going to be white or brown? And we, you would have said, definitely 50-50. Okay? And now the question is, we see the front. Will that make us change our bet at all? Surely it must make a difference. Um, and that's a very credible argument. That there, there is a dependence between the front and the back. So surely you shouldn't be betting 50-50 anymore. It doesn't, this argument doesn't tell you what the right answer is, but it does argue definitely not 50-50 because we've just learned something. We know something that we didn't know and there is a dependence. And that's a good argument too. All right. So let me give you a suggestion. Always write down the probability of everything. And this is uh, copyright Steve Gull, who is a professor over in the building next door. Write down the probability of, ever, of everything, all the variables in the problem. Then you can condition on what has happened, and you will be able to deduce by the simple laws of probability what the answer to your question is. So in this case, everything is the front face and the reverse face. And before I did the shuffling and drew the card out, the probability of the front face being white or black and the reverse face being white or black, the probability of this pair of variables being white and white was one third. The probability of it being brown and brown was one third. And the probability of the other two things is a third, because you get that by the third card, the black-white card, this chap coming along, and it's 50-50 which way he'll go. And so there's a sixth chance there, and a sixth chance there. That is the joint probability of everything. And now, with this joint probability, we can condition on data and anything else you want to throw in. And data is what we're given, and what we're given is we're in this world. So today, the white face came up. So we condition on front being white. And we can then work out the probability that the reverse is white, for example, by renormalizing this probability distribution, and we get two-thirds. Okay. 
This may not convince people who still really think it's 50-50, how much is 50-50? How can you say it's two-thirds? That's rubbish. And so I've got one final argument that I hope will help. And then once this argument has been accepted, maybe it will compel you to agree that it's a good idea to write down the probability of everything. So here's the final argument, and it's not that the reverse was indeed white. That happened to be true, but it didn't have to be. The argument goes like this. Imagine that we play this game lots of times, and instead of asking, what's the probability the other face is white, I always ask you the question, what's the probability that the other face is the same as the one you're seeing now? Okay, so, <laughs> this one, they're the same. This one, they're the same. This one, they're not the same. So two-thirds of the time, the face will be the same on the back as it is on the front. So when you see a white, there's a two-thirds chance that the back is white. And when you see a brown, there's a two-thirds chance that the back is brown. Okay, so that's not based on probability theory, and I think it's a fairly compelling argument that the correct answer is two-thirds. And hopefully that's convinced you that we should use probability theory. Because if you can't actually reliably solve this exercise involving just one random variable, which is which card, and another random variable, which is which way up it went. So it's a two random variable uh, problem. If a smart audience of uh, graduates from Cambridge can't reliably solve this problem and just say, oh yeah, it, I, I know it, it's fine, I've got the answer, that really shows you, yeah, inference is a little bit tricky. Inference isn't totally straightforward. Humans are often very good at inference, but if you want to be sure you're getting it right, use probability theory, because probability theory will always get you the right answer. Okay. All right, so let's now talk some more about noisy channels. Um, and actually, let me just uh, remind myself what comes up. Let, let's talk through, through this. We're, where we're heading is we're going to talk a bit, bit more about inference, and we're also going to talk about information measures for noisy channels. Our classic noisy channel is the binary symmetric channel up there top right, which um, is obscured by a wireless icon. Okay, go away. Poof. <laughs> okay, the binary symmetric channel with inputs 0 and 1, and it flips a fraction f of the bits. So we'll talk a lot about that channel in due course, but we want to understand coding theory for any noisy channel. And whenever we're dealing with noisy channels, we need to know how to do inference. And I used to introduce people to inference with a different puzzle. Instead of the three cards, I would show people the three doors problem where the game show host says, here's the rules of the game. I'm going to hide a very desirable prize here, a national rail pass. Behind one of these three doors, the game show host always explains the rules first before the game happens. And the rules are, I will hide the prize behind one of these doors. Then I will ask you, the player, to choose a door. You have a free choice. And you choose it by naming it. And we don't open it. Then I, the game show host, guarantee that I will open another of the doors, not the one you chose. And I guarantee when I do that, promise me, I promise you, trust me, that the prize will not be revealed at that stage. So then the prize is clearly either behind door one or door two in this uh, example shown here, door one being the one you chose and door two being the other door that he didn't open. And then the uh, player gets the chance to stick or switch if you want. And then you'll get what's behind the final door you end up at after either sticking or switching. And the options for this puzzle then work like this. That was the rules being explained. Now, now you go ahead and play the game. The player chooses door one. The host says, in accordance with the rules, I will now open either door two or door three and will not reveal the prize. And as promised, he, he opens the door. It's door three. It doesn't reveal the prize. And the question is, should you stick? Should you switch? Or does it make no difference? And I used to use this as my introductory example on probability theory because people would argue very hotly about it and say, well, it's either behind door or one, door one or two, it's 50-50, you know, this empty door doesn't make any difference, it's 50-50. And other people would say, oh, no, 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 you, you should switch. And some people would say you should stick. Um, 
And it used to be contentious, but unfortunately, most people have heard of this puzzle, um, and so it doesn't really work anymore. We, let's have a quick vote. Votes for A, votes for B, you should switch. Votes for C, it makes no difference. So you see, it's a useless educational device. Um, it's been ruined because everyone's gone and talked about it. And the really annoying thing is they've talked about it in a way such that no one has actually learned anything. And you are my proof of that, because a moment ago, you voted for a lot of you. You're not all the proof, but this lot, uh, you know, this controversy here between B and C proves that an educational disaster has happened. The three doors puzzle, which is a fantastic puzzle, it's really educational, has been ruined because everyone now knows the answer, but they don't understand it. A, B, C here, these are exactly equivalent to each other. The three cards and the three doors, they are the same problem as each other. And yet, I showed you the same problem and you didn't get it right, even though you'd allegedly learnt the answer. So, learning isn't about memorising things, it's about understanding. So that's my little rant on the three doors. Um, so, the message people should be getting from the three doors problem is don't memorize the answer to a stupid puzzle because then you'll be useless at solving future inference problems. Instead, learn the message that you should use probability theory and then you will be equipped to solve any puzzle of this type in the future. Okay, rant over. So, what should we do now? Let's talk about noisy channels. What we're going to do with noisy channels is they're always going to have an input and an output, and a channel defines a set of conditional distributions. If you condition on an input, the channel defines what the probability of the output is going to be. The channel doesn't define a joint distribution, it just defines a set of conditional distributions. And we can only actually do inference if we've got uh, the probability of everything, so we need a joint distribution. So I'm going to run through a very simple example where I assume I've got a joint distribution. Okay, where are we? Yeah. I'll write down a joint distribution and I'll define some information measures for that joint distribution. Then when we move on to channels, we'll have to get a joint distribution by adding to the conditional distributions defined by the channel a distribution on the inputs. So that's how it's all going to join up. But I'll start with a joint distribution or a joint ensemble. And here's an example of one. And I'll define all the different information measures we can uh, make for this joint ensemble. So I'm going to tell you the joint probability of two random variables, x and y, which are dependent random variables, a bit like the front and the back of the three cards. So the first variable x can take on values 1, 2, 3, or 4. y can take on values 1, 2, 3, or 4. And the joint probabilities are 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, 1 thirty tooth, 1 thirty tooth, 1 sixteenth, 1 eighth, 1 thirty tooth, 1 thirty tooth, 16th, all across, and then a quarter, and zero, and zero, and zero. From a joint distribution, you can always define marginals, and marginal probabilities are written in the margins, and they are obtained by adding up, and here we have a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and a quarter, as it happens, for the probability of y, and then in the bottom margin, we have a half, one quarter, one eighth, one eighth. Now, we already defined for a single random variable how to measure its entropy. And so when we've got a joint ensemble, there's a bunch of straightforward things we can do with that entropy definition. we can write down what the marginal entropy of x is, and we can write down what the marginal entropy of y is, for example. So I'm defining for you, by example, what marginal entropy means. 
marginal entropy of x is the entropy of this distribution here, and that is 7 over 4 bits. The marginal entropy of y is the entropy of this distribution, and that's 2 bits. And we can define the entropy of the pair xy. So you could think of the pair xy as being a single random variable that takes on these 16 possible values with these 16 probabilities written here. And you can say, what's the entropy of this distribution here? So we just do the normal sum over all pairs xy, p of xy, log base 2, 1 over p of x and y. Okay, and that comes out to 27 over 8 bits for this joint distribution. And those numbers I've just written down, these three numbers, have the property that if you show them graphically and draw h of x that way and h of x and y this way, and then you try and make h of y nudge up against this right-hand side here, you find they don't quite match up. So h of x and h of y added together are a bit bigger than h of x and y for this example. And this is actually always true that these guys will always overlap or they might just up, abut up against each other and exactly add up to the joint entropy. And they only ever do that if x and y are independent random variables. So the size of this overlap here is a measure of how much dependence there is between the random variables. Let me define a few more things we can do with a joint distribution. We can define conditional probabilities. For example, P of X given Y is defined to be the joint probability of X and Y divided by the probability of Y. And we can write that out for all 16 values of X and Y. So here is P of X given Y for Y going from 1, 2, 3, 4, and x going 1, 2, 3, 4. So if we condition on y being 1, then we can read out that top row probability and normalize it, and we get a half, a quarter, 1 eighth, 1 eighth. And the next row goes a quarter, a half, 1 eighth, 1 eighth, when we normalize it. When we normalize the third row, they're all equal, so we get a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, one quarter, and when we normalize the bottom row, we get one, zero, zero, zero. So those four probability vectors are the four possible conditional distributions. And for every one of those probability distributions, we can write down its entropy. So we can write down the entropy of x given that y is equal to one. We can write down the entropy of x given that y equals two, and so forth. And the entropy of this guy here, this distribution, it's fairly familiar, it's 7 over 4. This one's 7 over 4 as well. This one, entropy of the uniform distribution is 2 bits. And the entropy of 1 and 3 zeros is 0 bits, because it's a certain distribution. We know, condition on y being 4, that x is definitely 1. So what do we think about that? Well, we notice that it's possible for the conditional entropy of x given a particular value of y to be the same as what we started with, 7 over 4, or the same, or bigger, or smaller. So you, when you get data about y, it's possible for your uncertainty about x to either go up, stay the same, or get less. So that's an interesting observation. And something we can do with all of these is we could say, on average, when we learn y, how much information content will x then have? So what's the average entropy of x 
given y. So I'm now defining for you a thing called the conditional entropy. All of these were conditional entropies as well. There were four particular conditional entropies for particular values of y. And then this is the really important one, the conditional entropy, which is the average, averaging over all possible values of y, weighting together the entropy of x given that value of y. Notice I'm carefully, consistently using little y to mean a particular value, and capital Y is the name of um, the, the random variable itself. Uh, okay, and that adds up to 11 over 8 bits. Similarly, we can work out what the entropy of y given x is. Similarly, go through the calculation and you get 13 over 8 bits. Now, In this case, I pointed out that the entropy of x, when you learn y, could stay the same, could go up, or could go down. When we worked out the conditional entropy, we got 11 over 8 bits, and that is smaller than 7 over 4. And let me now tell you a theorem, which is that it is always the case that the conditional entropy with capital letters is less than or equal to the marginal entropy. And finally, it can all be glued together like this in a single diagram. So this is not at all obvious, but it's true. That h of y given x fits here, and h of x given y fits here. And thus, we have rather nice word stories that we can tell, which is the total information that you get when you learn x and y is the sum of the information you get when you learn y plus the amount of information you then get when, having already learned y, you then go on to learn x. Or the information content of x and y, on average, is the information content of learning x by itself, then already knowing x, learning y. OK, so the sum of these two is this thing here. And this overlap here, as I said, is a measure of dependence between these variables. Uh, the relationship I just said about this plus this equaling that, some people call it the chain rule for entropy. The final thing I want to do is define this creature here. This measure of dependence between x and y is going to be a lot of fun when we play with channels. It's going to be the most important thing we want to know, and it's called the mutual information between the random variables x and y. And we call it i of x semicolon y, and it's what it shows in the picture. So you can pick any way of um, obtaining this from the picture. For example, it's the difference between h of x and h of x given y. Or it's the difference between h of y and h of y given x. And that's the mutual information. What we're going to do in the next lecture is glue this together with a channel. A channel is a set of conditional distributions so for the binary symmetric channel, it doesn't specify how often you should use the 0 and the 1. It just says, if you send a 0, there's a 90% chance you'll get a 0 out. If you send a 1, there's a 90% chance you'll get a 1 out. So the channel defines conditional distributions. And then we can turn those conditional distributions, if we want to, into a joint distribution on input and output by inventing a probability distribution for the input then you can compute all of these information measures for the joint distribution you've defined. And when we've done that, we can start talking about the theory of how to communicate reliably over noisy channels. Are there any questions? Okay, thanks very much for coming, and see you next week.